I'm not enough, God. I'm not enough to be in your presence unless you come, God. Father, we're not enough unless you come. Father, because it's your grace that abounds. Father, right now, Lord, you fill us. Oh, Lord, you come down and pour your grace and mercy on each and every one of us. Because I truly know I'm not enough. Father, I'm a broke, broke man. Father, we're broken vessels. But Father, you can take those broken vessels and you can use them to glorify and honor you. So Father, that I'm not up here, you come through me right now, Lord, that your name would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank Pastor James again. Tell you, man. Uh, just to have the opportunity to preach this this title of a message to start it off. They, I'm telling you, Pastor James, Josh, and Richie, man, they were all telling me about, hey, can you do this? You've lost your salvation. Have you? Let me tell you something. God is good, and God's grace is sufficient. And if God's grace is sufficient, then I'm good, and I'm safe, and I know I, who I am. Hey, don't let failure become final in your life. It's not God's will. Hidden in every mistake is an opportunity, a possibility, a doorway of discovery. You see, God doesn't want your mistakes to be a prison. God will use your mistakes to be a pathway to a greater revelation of his grace. You see, God wants to take your, your mess-ups, and he truly wants to turn them into miracles. And only God can do that. In Acts 4, 33, it says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And grace, great grace was upon them all. I want to focus on that last part. And great grace was upon them all. I believe God wants to put on you, on your family, and on your failures, great grace. You see, mistakes are the price we pay for a full life, for a living life. We're going to make mistakes. The key is, are those mistakes going to keep you down? It was said by someone that, 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 that you have to take a licking and keep on ticking. That word's called resilience. We need to learn to be resilient in the Lord. We need to learn to, to take that licking and keep on ticking. And know that God is right there with us, walking us through whatever situation that we're going through. Whatever mistake that we're doing or made. You see, mistakes, I believe, are the catalyst to miraculous. I believe that, the, that mistakes can catapult us into God's miracles. You see, don't let mistakes destroy you. You see, heaven wants to make you and hell wants to maim you. And both want to use your mistakes. The adversary wants to mock you and maim you for the rest of your life. For the mistakes you have made. But God, but God can transform you through the mistakes to who he wants you to be. God doesn't want you to stay in the place that you're at. He wants to move you through. You see, Adam's mistake brought a, a revelation about God that Adam and Eve would have never known without making a mistake. Because if Adam looked at the only being that made a mistake in the universe, Adam would have showed up and the only person he would have saw was Lucifer and God did not give him a second chance. But when Adam and Eve failed, God said, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you another side of me that you wouldn't know unless you made this mistake. You see, I'm the God of mercy. I'm the God of grace. And the greater the mistake, the greater God's grace God's great grace 
It's for us all. And, and, and they were joking around because I, I love this song. And almost in every one of my messages, I, I had to kind of sing it. And they were saying, how many times are you going to sing a song, Stephen and Richard? How many times are you going to sing that song? It's going to be one. It's going to be two. Uh, Stephen said two. Richard said one. But it, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will what? Oh, yeah. So let me sing it one more time. Grace, grace, God's grace. One more time. So it's three. Grace, grace. See, I didn't want to stop at three. I don't want to stop at ten because I know whatever God gives, his grace is sufficient. And that's something that we need to claim. You see, God's grace is amazing. And thank God I can experience his grace and mercy new every morning. God's good. Oh, and he's always good. So you may have made a mistake, but you're not one. Let that sink down in your, in your soul right there. You have made a mistake, but you are not a mistake. You may, you may be have failed, but you're not a, a failure. And, and as I was reading that or as I was writing that down, it brought me back to a memory as I was growing up as a, ch as a child. My grandmother in California who would talk to me half in Mexican and half in English, but she would always come up with these words of wisdom for me. She was the only one that would call me by my first name and my middle name. The only one. No one else has ever called me Daryl Lee. But she would call out, Daryl Lee. And see, I would come in every day after school thinking that I was a failure because I did something wrong. I got in trouble or I failed a test. or Man, I wasn't too smart back then because all I wanted to do was play around. But I'd come in all mad and upset and, and probably because I hit a couple people on the way home, knocked them down and kicked them a couple times. But I would have my head hung down low and I'd say, Mom, I just, I just failed. I'm a failure. And she would say, Daryl Lee, you're not a failure. You're not a failure. You're not a failure. You're more than that to me. And many of us get stuck in that mentality. I failed. I failed. And now I'm a failure. You may be down. But down is not your destiny. If you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, your salvation, no matter what you have done, is still intact. God still has a plan. God still has a purpose. And he's going to use you because of the mistakes that you've made. But I know that his grace is greater than any mistake that we can ever make in our lives. You will come out of your mistake and realize that God has opened a doorway, a doorway of discovery, a portal to a possibility that you would have never discovered had you not gone through that mistake, that mess up, that slip. I'm not saying for you to go out and make mistakes or, or, or commit sins so that you can find out more about God's grace. What I'm telling you is the devil means to destroy you, imprison you, defeat you, and humiliate you. And God says, I put great grace on mistakes, and they can become your doorway of possibilities. Your failure is not final. Micah said it in Micah 7, 8. It says, rejoice not over my enemies. You, you, you see me. This is my paraphrase. You see me messed up, but don't start throwing a party. Don't start rejoicing. Don't start bringing the cake. For when I fall, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, it's not forever. His light, His light will find me again. Oh, don't, leave, don't let your fear become final in your life. It's not God's will for you. It's not God's will. God will never define you by your mistakes. That's big. He will never define you by your mistakes. Your critics will. 
Your enemies will. They'll define you for the rest of your life for the mistakes that you've made 10, 20 years ago. God will never define you by your mistakes. He will never define you by your mistakes. Excuse me. There was only one, one person that I know in the New Testament that brought up failures of a person. And that was the brother of the prodigal son. The older brother. The father never did. The prodigal son sinned against his father. We sinned against our father. His father was waiting on him to come back. Man, this is neat. The story of the prodigal son. Because I've been a prodigal. You've been a prodigal. We've all been prodigals in our life. But here's this prodigal. It goes to his daddy. He said, dad, give me all what's mine. It's mine anyway. Go on and give it to me. And so his dad said, okay, here it is. Then he takes off into a far city, and he squanders the live, his, all his inheritance away. I mean, he was living it up, buying drinks for all the brothers out there, buying food, whatever food. If I was there, he'd be buying food. I'm just telling you. He'd buy me some steak or something. So here's his prodigal, and then he wastes it all. Then a famine came. Then he goes and searches for a job, and he finds himself in the hog pit of life. Y'all know what a hog is? That, that's a big pig for all y'all city people. That's a big pig. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do to that big pig. You can put Chanel number five on that pig. You can put a pink ribbon, paint its hoofs pink. And when you let that hog go, it's going to run right back in the mud. So he's in the hog pit of life, just, just fighting for the hus, just something to eat. And he looks, he's up there and he looks up and he says, in my father's house. Oh, it's when we come to our senses that God begins to speak to our hearts. In my father's house. In my father's house. Listen, he, he got all this speech together to tell his father. And, and as he was coming back, his father dropped everything. It, look, at the Bible said he ran to his son because the father was waiting for him. He never stopped being his father. The son never stopped being the son. He was waiting for him. Let me tell you, he was waiting. God is waiting for us every day of our lives. When we slip, when we fall, when we hit the ground, whatever it is, God is saying, oh, I want you to come back. Oh, I just want you to run back. You come back. He's waiting on us. Not to kick us in the, in the side or stomp our foot, but to take us in. He's waiting to take us back. What was God's purpose in sending his son to die for in the first place? Anybody know that answer? To die for our sins, to bring reconciliation between us and God, to forgive us. So is Jesus dying once good enough? Hmm? Is it good enough? If it's not, then there's no reason for us to be here tonight. There's no reason for us to come Sunday. If it's not enough, I know that it is enough. And I know that his grace is sufficient. He is waiting. Look what the father did. He threw a coat on his son. He said, bring me that coat. I'm going to throw it on. It's time to throw a party. The son of mine. There it is again. This son never stopped being his son. This son of mine was dead, was lost. And now he's alive. You know, when I've gotten far away from God and I've sinned, I felt dead in my life. I felt lost in my life. But when I came back, oh, it was a party because God began to pump me up and God began to encourage me. Never, he never quit being his son. We may, mistake, we may make mistakes. We may sin. We may get far away from God. But if you're born again, you'll never stop being his son. You'll never stop being his daughter. Never, never will you stop. He said, I don't, God will never define you by your worst mistakes. I mess up. You mess up. We all mess up. But thank God he can take those mess ups and turn them into miracles. Thank God. 
How many of y'all have ever have ever made a terrible mistake? Hmm? I know you have. If you if you haven't, then you're lying and you're in church lying. Listen again. Let me ask that again. How many of you have ever made a mistake? Yes. Thank God there's great grace. Thank God there's great grace. God, in order to conform us into his image, lets us fail because he lets us come to the end of ourselves. You see, it's not about me. It's about him. And we get stuck in this. It's God. There's another song that them kids used to sing. It's God still working on me. Y'all know that song? Well, I don't know it, but I know that song. God's still working on me. He made the sun, the sun, the moon, the stars, Jupiter and Mars. God's, is that it? He's still working on me. I See, I know some of it maybe. Or, or I just made it up, but there it is. But right now, God knows everything that you've done. He, he knows everything I've done. He knows everything about you. He knows every mistake you have ever made. But when you come running back to him and say, God, man, I messed up. I've sinned. Against you. You know what God does? He forgives us. He forgives us. And he cleanses us. Adam made a terrible mistake. He lied about his wife. He lied about his wife. And then Adam, what he did is then he went out and he slept with someone that wasn't his wife. God, God, God said, go. Move on. I'm still going to make you the father of faith. It's amazing that God uses messed up people. Elijah called down fire from heaven, outran the horses of Ahab, and, and, and did amazing miracles. But the minute he heard Jezebel was after him, he tucked tail and ran. He went into a cave, trembling in fear. He made a mistake after all the good stuff, all the miracles that God allowed him to prepare or do. And now he's sitting in a cave. And I love the fact when he's sitting in the cave feeling bad about the mistakes that he made. God came in a still, small voice. He said, I still called you. I still have plans for you. I still have plans for your life. You see, God wants to teach you and me from our mistakes. David committed adultery. He actually murdered the man of the lady that he slept with. And now there was consequences for his action. The baby died. Huh? And then later on, Absalom was chasing after him, his own son, wanting to kill him to usurp his throne. I mean, there's consequences for our sins, but God does forgive our sins. But David committed adultery, and he, and he had consequences. But God's word said he was a man after God's own heart because great grace was given. Oh, Jacob, he did a lot of bad things. Jacob, you're a liar, you're a deceiver, you're a loser, but I'm going to make you a prince. I'm going to rename you. Your name will no longer be Jacob, but it's going to become Israel, which means clinging firmly to God and overcoming. God gave him a new name. When we come to God, he gives us a new name, a new beginning, a new hope, a new direction. You say, you may be, you may be wrestling with something in your life, wrestling with mistakes, wrestling with, with sin, whatever it may be. You cling to God and watch God move in your life and watch him give you a new hope, a new direction, and a new name. That's what God wants to do. I love the fact that Peter, he really messed up. He really messed up. He lied and he cussed. And, and what did he do? He denied Jesus three times. And when Jesus showed up in his resurrected body, he was cooking him a restoration meal. Jesus didn't say, hey, Peter, remember those keys I gave you? Give them back. Give them back. Jesus is saying to you, I haven't changed my mind about you. I haven't changed my mind about your purpose and your destiny. I'm telling you, I knew you would mess up. I knew you would mess up, but I put great grace on great mistakes. If you just look at me, I will never, I will never 
leave you nor forsake you. I don't know who I'm preaching tonight. I don't, but there's somebody, somebody here tonight that needs to hear this. Your mistake is not final. Turn to someone and say, don't let your mistakes hold you hostage. Turn to someone and say, don't let, let, don't let your mistakes hold you hostage. You see, God is saying, I haven't given up on you. I told you I would never leave you nor forsake you. David's enemies wanted to pounce on him. But he said in Psalms 38, 18, I will declare my iniquity. You know what declare means? It means to open up your mouth and cry out, God, I made a mistake. Then you move from admission to remission. If you have cancer and cancer goes into remission, it means that it's losing power. It's going down. You go from declaration to restoration. From declaration, God, I've sinned and I'm not worthy, not for a minute, unless you come. Not for a moment, not for a second. You see, I'm guilty, but God's not pouncing on me. God's not jumping on me. The minute I ask him to forgive me, I'm forgiven. And all he sees is the blood of Jesus Christ that has covered me and make me whole. I've made mistakes. I've made big mistakes, but my mistakes don't define me. My heavenly father defines me and he says I'm chosen. He says I'm royalty. He says I'm clean. He says I'm what? I'm washed. How about you? I believe in God's great grace. I believe the greater the mistake, the greater God's grace is. The greater failures are, the greater God's grace is. God is greater than any wrong choices that you've ever made. There's a difference between grace, which is given, and I don't deserve it, but it's given, and mercy holds back what I deserve. You see, what's powerful is when you put, when you have grace and mercy working hand in hand, you have grace giving you what you don't deserve, and you have mercy holding back what you do deserve, and God's holding back. What we deserve, just like the children of Israel, when he held back the waters and they climbed through the, the Red Sea and they went to the other side, he was holding it back until everyone got across safe. And the minute he got that got them across safe, he let go. And the water came down and drowned those enemies of the Israelites. You see, God wants to hold those things back that you and I deserve. And he wants to get us to the other side so that you and I can have peace. You know, I remember the night that I gave Jesus my life. I remember I was 18 years old, out of school, at a church down the road, Alpine, and, and Charles Hutzler was preaching, and, and a teacher had invited me, and that, that's why I wanted to be a teacher, kind of, sort of. Really, I wanted to be a teacher because I could hold a paddle and whoop kids. <laughs> and then I get there, and they stop the whooping. <laughs> I said, go figure. You know, I'm going to retire here in a few years, and they're probably going to bring it back. I'm going to say, I want to go sub so I can use that paddle. But after my best friend and his dad got in an argument and he jumped out of the truck and he hit a culvert head on, he was in coma for a whole week. And every one of his friends were there. He was my best friend. I grew up next door to him. And I hung around there. Night, day, night day and the whole time I was there there was one lady that stood with me she was a teacher she's the one that told me about Jesus 
because she cultivated a relationship we, with me and I knew that she loved me and I knew what she was telling me was the truth. You say, you may not be a preacher, you may not be a teacher, you may not be anything, but if you're a Christian and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then God gives you the ability to tell someone about Jesus. You see, for a long time, God was holding it back. He was holding it back from me. Man, I could have died and went to hell and broke it wide open. But he held it back until that very moment. And I came running down that, that aisle of that church. You see an 18-year-old boy just got out of school, and, you know, just graduated. He's running down the, the aisle of that church, and he got slobber coming out. I mean, slobber like down here. You know, I want that. I want that. And I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior right there. And he made sure I was saved. She came running down and hugged me. It's all because she took the time to tell me about Jesus. You see, God holds back what we deserve. And he gives us what we don't deserve. Let me ask you something right now. If you died right now, do you know you would go to heaven 100%? Because if you don't, then you're lost. And coming to church is not going to get you there. Listen to me act stupid and preach. It's not going to get you there. Pastor James is not going to get you there. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Maybe you've made a mistake and you just need to come and lay it at the altar and say, God, I want a new beginning. I want a new hope. I want a new direction. I want a new life. Right now is it. Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for allowing Pastor James to allow me to preach your word. Father, right now, I know that grace abounds. That grace is greater than anything I can ever do. And no matter what I do, because I have Jesus in my heart and in my life, I'm never not going to be your son. And I thank you for that great grace. Father, whatever we have on our heart today, whether we're standing there and we're giving it to you or coming to the altar, whatever it may be, Father, you take it.